You know, if you're going to talk about heat, you end up talking about housing. You end up talking about yeah. hunger, about climate, about pollution. I mean, it just, it starts to tie so many different things together. Welcome to a movement of kindness and empathy. You're listening to Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. Embarking on a mission to unite our city under the banner of compassion, we're one among 440 cities around the globe standing together to build a more compassionate world. Now introducing the man leading the charge, your host, Will Rucker. Welcome to Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. This is season five, and we are going deep into how compassion is practically applied in our community, in our faith, in our world today. And so we're touching on a number of what I find to be very fascinating subjects. And this episode is no exception. We talk about heat. We're in August. It's been hot, y'all. I don't know about you, but I'm just trying to stay cool. But uh, it's hard here in Vegas. So we've got a very special guest, Ariel Chenard from the Heat Lab Resilience Center. Did I get that right? Yeah, it's, uh, you're so close. It was the, it's the Southern Nevada Heat Resilience Lab. There we go. Yes. And we're going to talk all about heat resilience and everything. So thank you for being a guest on the show, Ariel. I'm so excited to talk with you today. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we've had a chance to talk before this episode, which I don't always get to do. So I feel like we're just old friends catching up here. I feel the same way. Good. So to start us off, I'm going to ask the hardest question of the entire show. And it's how do you define compassion? Wow, that is a really tough question. Um, I think for me, compassion is recognizing the humanity of the inherent humanity of everyone we meet um, and to honor that with love and good attention. Man, well, you really, this is a tough one. <laughs> Yeah, but it's, I, I think compassion comes from a, a space of, of love and empathy. Um, and it's about recognizing everybody's inherent humanity, um, capacity for love, uh, and then acting accordingly. So when I think about the work I do on resilience and climate change and heat here in Southern Nevada, um, it does come from a compassionate place where people who are most impacted now and for future generations as well. So I try to just kind of always do the right thing with that, with that love and that knowledge of our shared humanity in my heart. Yeah. Well, I mean, phenomenal answer. I, just, I couldn't have put it any better myself. I think that love piece is critical. You don't often hear that word in this science space, but it's so important. And I think that um, at the end of the day, love is what matters most. Thank you for sharing that. So for those that are unfamiliar with the area, can you describe some of the specific challenges that Southern Nevada, Las Vegas had due to extreme heat? Great. So I think when most people think of Las Vegas, they probably think of palm trees and the strip. Um, they probably know it's hot. Um, Southern Nevada is a, a very hot place. We have a pretty extreme climate. We get cold in the winters, not as cold as some places, but cold enough. And we get rather hot in the summers. Um, what makes it challenging here is that Las Vegas is the second fastest warming city in America uh, after Reno, Nevada, actually. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so due to our already high temperatures as you know, as we start to see more and more impacts from climate change and our summers grow hotter, it just means that our communities are having to deal with ever hotter daytime temperatures and in particular, hotter nighttime lows, which means that people, infrastructure, all of the things that make this region a region, you know, not, we never get um, a good cool down, a good break from the heat overnight. Um, the other thing that makes it really challenging to work on heat here is uh, the urban heat island effect, which is mm. um, a characteristic of the built environment in cities 
In fact, most cities are going to have an urban heat island effect. Um, here, it happens to be pretty extreme because of how much solar gain we get during the day. So the sun warms up all of our dark, impervious surfaces, whether that's road surfaces, sidewalks, buildings. Um, and that causes certain areas of our city to be hotter than others, uh, sometimes up to 11 degrees hotter than other places, which is, which is a pretty significant, wow. yeah, that's a pretty significant difference when you start thinking about the fact that we occasionally have highs, um, you know, of 115 degrees, add 11 degrees to that. that that's pretty stinking hot. Um, and those places too cool down less overnight as well. So this, this is a, a, it is a challenging space to be working on heat. Um, and in the past too, I think there was kind of an institutional uh, attitude towards heat, which you can still hear from time to time, or even Vegas residents will just kind of be like, well, yeah, duh, it's hot in Vegas. Oh, and, yeah. Right? And they kind of, they, they miss the, the kind of problematic aspect of how heat especially those extreme temperatures, acts as a chronic stressor for so many of the folks who live here. Um, and yes, it is hot in Las Vegas. Everybody is exposed to our extreme temperatures, um, but, the, but, it's, but heat isn't experienced equally. That depends very much on who you are, where you live, what resources you have. Um, so a lot of the people kind of shrug and say, yeah, it's just hot in Las Vegas, you know. They aren't the folks who are necessarily most impacted by our extreme temperatures. So you said a couple of things that were surprising for me. One is we're second behind Reno. I would not have expected Reno because, I mean, I typically go kind of ju uh, January through March-ish and it's cold. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> That to be the fastest warm. That's amazing. Like, what? What's the difference? Why is Reno warming faster than Las Vegas? Well, it just has more room to warm. If that makes sense. So they're they're okay. We already are so hot that even though we're still warming, that it that that measured sort of difference in temperatures isn't as big as it is in Reno. It's a little bit like how climate scientists say the Arctic is the fastest warming place on Earth. Does that kind of make sense a little? I, I, that's not that the clearest explanation. Sense. Okay. Yeah. It was cooler yeah, to no, begin with, so it, so it warms. Yeah. So it's warming. It's more dramatic. Yeah. Okay. But why? I just would not have expected. I would have expected Phoenix or Tucson, something like that. But hey, in the, we're, at least we're first in something here in Nevada, right? <laughs> yeah. We're number one. <laughs> <laughs> So how does extreme heat impact different populations? And I'm thinking really like social economics or, or ethnic or racial, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, and this is true of, again, a lot of cities across America, that urban heat islands are found primarily in black and brown neighborhoods. And this is due to redlining and the type of uh, unwillingness how it's purposeful unwillingness to resource those communities in the past. And so folks there, they're, you know, maybe their homes are built differently or during a different time period and are not as well insulated. They don't have as, you know, these neighborhoods may not have as many trees. There are a lot of different factors that can contribute to why a heat island is a heat island. Um, but that, that absolutely tends to be the case that those those urban heat island neighborhoods um, also tend to be socioeconomically disadvantaged as well, uh, which is really hard for residents there. If these are lower income areas or, you know, just blue collar folks who work in their jobs. And, you know, there are still there are people here in Las Vegas who are choosing between keeping their home comfortable or putting food on the table. So when you think about an urban heat island neighborhood or or region in our city, uh, and think about the, the difference in temperature between those neighborhoods and neighborhoods with more trees or more affluent neighborhoods. You can see how that 11 degree difference makes a huge, has a huge impact on people's day to day life. Yeah. It's part of it just geographic, like some locations are, are just higher up than others. That is definitely part of it here in the Vegas Valley. So the west side of town has a little bit of altitude on the east side of town. Um, so being lower in altitude means that typically on the east side, it's uh, 
handful of degrees hotter than it is on the west side. But the urban heat island effect is so dramatic that the difference in altitude doesn't explain the total difference in temperature, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, and please continue to try to talk because I interrupted. Oh, that's okay. I was also going to point out too that age has a big uh, impact on how vulnerable people are when it gets really hot. So if you have communities with a lot of uh, senior citizens or even very young people, babies, toddlers, um, or neighborhoods where people have a higher incidence of chronic illness, like congestive heart failure, COPD, asthma, um, those, those factors can make certain parts of our city more vulnerable to higher temperatures. Um, and the uh, RTC, the Regional Transportation Commission, did a really wonderful study that was published a couple summers ago, three summers ago, kind of lost track now, um, that took a look at about, oh gosh, 13, 14 different variables to kind of visualize spatially where heat vulnerability kind of exists within the, uh, the metro area here. And a lot of those neighborhoods are found on the east side. So this work, I mean, coming into the conversation, I'm like, well, it's fascinating. It's interesting because that's the scientist in me. And then, of course, this is Compassionate Las Vegas. So that part of me is starting to rise up there and my heart's bleeding in a, in yes. a way. How do you personally manage looking at this data and, and seeing oh my gosh, these people are impacted negatively and it's such a big undertaking. How do you personally show self-compassion and ensure your resilience in this effort? Yeah, you're, there, are, um, there are some really low moments. Um, I remember feeling pretty low um, in the beginning of July when we were you know, going into that long period of extreme heat. And knowing that even though I'm working on this problem, and even though I'm working on this problem with really great partners, um, it still wasn't enough in that moment. You know, the Southern Nevada Heat Resilience Lab is a brand new project. You know, we got started in spring of this year. This is our first summer. And it takes time to build resilience. And it takes time to do this work well and to do it um, with the proper types of engagement and information gathering. Um, but it was really hard to think about the stress and the suffering that communities were gonna be going through during that period of extremely hot weather. Um, I know that people lose their lives because of heat. And I know that very often these are the same people that are vulnerable in other ways. They may be unhoused, they may be poor. There are other circumstances in their lives uh, that I think make it easy for people to look away from them or disregard their suffering. Uh, and that can, be, that can be hard to know as well. Uh, so I just try to give myself some space and some grace and and know that it's, you know, I'm not doing this alone. <laughs> and to, to have faith in my, in my good partners and the other people who, who want this region and this, and our city to be, to be livable and resilience and resilient today and into the future. And sometimes I take that heavy feeling and just kind of sit with it. It's a part of the work. No, there, there's no. so much in what you share, just, just sitting with it though, that, that can be difficult. It's something I encourage everyone to do is to have the full human experience, that full range of emotion, including the ones that are not pleasant. So I, I love hearing that you choose intentionally to sit with it. And then I also love hearing that collaborative aspect because we need each other the way we've evolved as a species. Is only because we take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah. And occasionally I'll take that heavy feeling and sort of spin it on its head. And instead of feeling overwhelmed or, you know, very sad sometimes, I turn it into being stubborn. And I just mm. use it to help me keep going. 
you know, to, because it is, it is a really, this is, heat is a systemic issue. It touches on so many different aspects of our lives here in Southern Nevada. Um, you know, if you're going to talk about heat, you end up talking about housing. You end up talking about yeah. hunger, about climate, about pollution. I mean, it just, it starts to tie so many different things together. And it can feel like this really big, really snarly, wicked problem. And, and it is, and it's not until we find those, those nexuses for collaboration and start to create the conditions for change, you know, change itself is hard, but what levers can we pull? What conversations can we have? What can we do to create the conditions for change so that we can find those levers and pull on them and, and, you know, create that better future. When we come back, I want to talk about your mission, which includes co-creating. Mm-hmm. And so I want to hear your take on how you actually engage those that are most impacted by heat and how you do outreach into those communities and all that good stuff right after this. Treat others how you'd like to be treated. And that's the golden rule. Camp Anytown has taught me that knowledge is power, and if I utilize my voice, I can make a difference in the world, no matter how big or small. I learned that as long as we stand together, we can accomplish so much more. What Camp Anytown has taught me is that I am not crazy to think I can change the world. I'm crazy if I think I can do it alone. Camp Anytown has taught me that just because I'm different does not mean I don't belong. I learned at Camp Anytown to be more compassionate because you never know what somebody else is going through. Camp Anytown is a no-cost youth leadership camp that trains high school students in diversity, community, and inclusivity. When you choose the Golden Rule license plate, you play a part in a local camp that helps shape a better tomorrow. Learn more at dmvnv.com. This is Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. I'm Will Rucker, and here today from the Southern Nevada Heat Resilience Lab. I think I got that right this time. You nailed it. And uh, before the break, we were talking a little bit about how you personally show resilience. And one of the things you mentioned was collaboration. So in your mission, you talk about co-creating this this resilience, right? How do you engage communities and those that are impacted in your work? You know, I mentioned before that we are a new project. So our engagement efforts Mm -hmm. are just beginning. Uh, But what we're trying to do is to better engage the folks who are most impacted by heat. Um, You know, in the past, other planning around heat, other discussions around heat, you know, people might have sent out a survey or, you know, yeah, like a web survey or a link or, you know, an attempt was made at engagement, but what we want to do differently is really to create a space for listening and learning from those who are most impacted and allow the frontline communities to articulate their own priorities around heat. You know, because right now in the Vegas Valley, we have kind of one response to, to heat events, which is opening cooling zones. And this is a good and, and mm-hmm. useful thing. But we're not even sure if cooling centers are utilized by the folks who might need them most. Um, And so what we're doing actually this month on the 30th, we're meeting with um, leaders of community-based organizations from those urban heat island neighborhoods, uh, representative of of the populations that are most impacted by heat for kind of a a listening listening session. uh, that will, will be facilitated by my uh, my lovely counterpart, uh, Dr. Emma Bloomfield. Um, and then at the end of September, we're going to be holding a community member listening session. Um, so we're going to use the feedback from the uh, community leader listening session to help kind of focus and put some framework around the community member listening session so that we're giving folks a uh, confidential, that's really important, a confidential space to come and share what their experience with heat is, what what resources they need, uh, where we can do better with engagement. You know, 
How are people talking about heat in these neighborhoods? How are people talking about heat across Las Vegas? You know, what messages are going to work best for their communities? Um, that's not something we, that's not something we know. We could, we can, there are people who make tons of assumptions about that. We're not making that at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think that's when, that's the heart of co-creation is, is putting yourself in that constant learning and listening space so that as we move forward, we're following the, the direction of the folks who are most impacted by heat. Um, and so further messaging and engagement will, will be more of a conversation. It'll depend very much on what we hear. Um, so I think, I think that's kind of, that's still a little bit unusual in heat work. Um, I think some places kind of assume, okay, people need cooling centers and they need trees and neither of those things are bad. And both those things might be very appropriate for Las Vegas as well. But until we hear that from the folks who need those resources the most, we're not going to assume that that is the right solution. Yeah. And I, I don't know that I thought a lot about heat directly uh, prior to your work. And mm -hmm. I mean, I know that I've personally been hot, yeah, right. <laughs> but I mean, outside of that, just, just thinking about the, the domino impact of heat. I think is something that is just newer in my consciousness. So I'm really grateful we're able to have this conversation. And you kind of already answered the question, which was how are others thinking about heat? Mm -hmm. And what I heard you say is that's why you're holding these listening sessions to figure that out. Yeah, um, because it's, a, it's not really, there are a lot of assumptions about how people think about heat, but we don't, we don't know until we ask, you know, what is it like to be an outdoor worker, you know? What is it like to have to wait for public transportation? You know, I, there are so many different ways that heat can impact different people in our community and giving them the space to, you know, because people are the experts on their own experience, giving folks the space to tell us what they need to tell us, you know, oh, I don't really use cooling centers, but another neighborhood pool would be great. You know, we don't, I, <laughs> I'm just pulling that out of thin air because we don't, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, so this is, yeah. this is very, I, and I really want these conversations to be ongoing. I get very excited when I think about listening in this way, because I think that's, that's a space where change can emerge, where something, something new can be heard. Um, so I get very excited about the potential to, to be a part of, you know, creating a habitable Las Vegas. Yeah. So let's stick with this excitement and I want to dive into your imagination. How do you envision a heat adapted Southern Nevada? And I guess really a heat adapted Nevada since we've got Reno in the mix too. That is such a complicated question um, because there's so many different aspects to it. When I imagine a heat adapted, we'll just go with the Vegas metro area because that's where my expertise lies. Um, I imagine a much more involved community voice on deciding what adaptation measures are going to be most effective. So that could mean anything from increased tree canopy to built shade structures, cool roofs, solar covering the parking lots, you know, um, different types of ground cover as we start to remove turf, which is good because it saves water. Um, but what I'd like to see too, is like a, a change in how we, how we build out here. Um, sometimes I look at houses out here and I just like, what? this doesn't belong in the desert. <laughs> <And being milk. laughs> I, I guess personally, I envision like more desert adapted, um, architecture and, and building. And I know that we've, there's, we've made leaps and bounds of progress in, you know, requiring better insulation, water smart, energy smart appliances. I just think, I think out of necessity, I, we're going to probably have to change a lot of how we, how we build and how we think about our neighborhoods and how we think about our city centers and all these different things. Um, that is a huge and wild question. And I love it. And I don't know that I can really paint you a 
a good enough picture because I think so much of this is still emerging. Um, but what I'd like to imagine is a Las Vegas that is habitable and comfortable and well adapted to this extreme climate, not, not just for today, but for 50 years into the future. You look at some of those climate projections and we think it's hot now. You know, take a look at what it's going to be like 50 years from now. So we need to think not only about, you know, what the city looks like today or what Nevada looks like today. We also have to start visioning for those future generations that want to call Nevada home. Yeah, that's so important. And I, I love the indigenous tradition of thinking seven generations down. How does what I do today impact that seventh generation? So I love your approach. I think it's so important. One of my models is nothing about us without us. And I feel like that's the spirit of how you're approaching this work. And it's, it's so broad. It's so complex. I mean, you have a, a life's work ahead of you for sure with this. I want to know how you got involved in heat. Wow. <laughs> Once upon a time, I worked um, in agriculture in Colorado. And okay. I started thinking a lot about changing climates and water scarcity and food production and urban areas. Um, my husband and I ended up moving from Colorado to Los Angeles, where those things were even more front of mind for me. And I ended up getting my master's in urban sustainability. Uh, while I was out there and it was just pure chance. I was looking for uh, a capstone project um, to finish my degree. And I knew I wanted to look at the connection between disaster, urban areas, and climate change. And my advisor said, hey, I know somebody at the LA City Office of Resilience. And I said, well, that sounds really cool. And I said, you know, feel free to pass my name along. It'd be great if I heard from them. And I ended up hearing from them and they said, hey, uh, we need somebody to help us with um, some work around heat. And I was like, wow, that sounds really fascinating. And from day one, I was hooked on the subject matter. So I was lucky enough to work on heat up there in LA. And then life threw us another curveball. We ended up out here in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to say I've continued that work here. Um, there are so many different climate impacts that we think about, that we know about, so that we don't, you know, the unknown unknowns. But one of the things that we're absolutely positive of is that more people are going to be exposed to extreme temperatures as our climates change. Um, I can't say I realized exactly how deeply relevant heat was going to be when I said yes to that first project. Um, but I'm just so grateful I did. It's just one of those wonderful moments in life where you say yes and you find your passion and you get to keep it going. I know, I know I am very, very lucky to do work that I find meaningful and that hopefully provides value to the communities that I live in. Wow. So for someone that is watching or listening to this episode and they're like, you know what, I want to get engaged in this, or I want to know more, what would you share with that person and how would they be able to connect with your work? Well, I would just say, you know, drop me an email. I'm happy to chat. Like I'll take you out for a cup of coffee. We can, we can mull it over. The other way to get involved is to look for those volunteer opportunities. And there are so many different volunteer opportunities that connect with heat, even if it's volunteering at a food bank. As I spoke about how people choose between cooling and groceries, um, it could be, uh, you know, donating water bottles to um, homeless resource groups and outreach groups. It could be, there are, there are just so many different ways, but I think the most meaningful would be to take a look at your community and find those around you who need that help. Um, I always talk about checking on your neighbors during extreme heat events, um, but that's really important. And it's that sort of like 
the spirit of we're all in this together and we need to t- take care of each other and kind of taking that personal responsibility and finding an opportunity to check in with, you know, maybe you have older folks in your family or somebody with a couple of young kids, somebody who's relying on public transportation, somebody who has a medical condition that makes the heat harder to deal with, um, elderly neighbors, anybody, everybody, check on each other. You know, be that voice that says, hey, heat can be dangerous. Don't be one of those people who kind of shrug it off and say, yeah, it's always hot in Las Vegas in the summer. I mean, you're right, but it's also really dangerous. Um, But if folks are interested in pursuing a more academic route towards working with heat, I'm happy to have a conversation with them. Um, I think it just depends on what they would want to focus on, like where, where they're felt compelled to go with that interest. Yeah, and and with this, I'm hearing so many pieces of those compassion embedded in that because compassion is that drive that causes us to say, yeah, we need to fix this. And Karen Armstrong says that a compassionate community is an uncomfortable community. And that's because we have these conversations where we talk about the real issues. The Hacker Convention was in town recently. And let's pretend that they had every digital billboard in the city and gave you the keyboard to type a message, what would that message be? Whoa. I don't know. Nothing. Oh my gosh. Okay. What would it be today? Or like? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So just be kind. Mm. I'm not even going to go with any. (laughs) <laughs> any heat related messaging like if it were a heat wave i'd probably I'd feel like heat is dangerous but like no be kind be kind it's easy to be kind wow well i want to thank you so much for for reaching out for joining the podcast i'm looking forward to our continued work together on this and there's just there's so much to do and your approach and your heart and your energy just it's just something that is so needed in our area so thank you for being you and for the work that you're doing that was a beautiful compliment thank you so much you're you're welcome i'm i it was a delight to be here i hope we get to do it again yes we certainly will this has been compassionate las vegas the podcast i'm will rucker and as i always remind you you are not just a drop in the ocean you are the entire ocean in a drop And what you do matters. So live compassionately and be kind. See you on the next episode.